the line from St. Francis that we're using this week is, Praise be you, my Lord, through Sister Water, who is very useful and humble and precious and chaste. Water is life. Did you know that this man, the scientist and photographer, has studied water as his life work? And he has taken so many pictures of water. When it's changing into snow, when it's changing into ice, and he discovered something interesting about water. Did you know that water retains the feelings that are placed upon it? What does that mean? When he goes to take these pictures of the drops of water, and he's been joyful with it, when he's been happy with it, when he's played it music that just inspires you, those bonds that the water forms are all connected and beautiful and pure. They are amazing the way the connections happen between all those molecules. But when you're mean to water, when you've polluted the water, those bonds where the H2Os connect to each other are not as stable and are broken. They don't create the beautiful picture that he goes for. The water has a memory of the good and the bad that happens to it. Other scientists have discovered that water can retain the memory of what has been in it for multiple occurrences of other things coming in it. They can study whether it remembers what has entered the water. Water is life. Did you know that when you are born, your body is mostly water? It's more than 70% water. And as you age, that's why we get all these wrinkles and things happen in our body. Because we start losing our water. We can drink as many gallons as we want, and we're still not retaining the water within <clears throat> us. Water is life. In the beginning, God hovered over the water. God hovered over the water, and as it describes in the book of Job, God then took that water and placed boundaries on it separating off water into lakes and ponds and rivers and streams and oceans. God put boundaries upon the water and showed the place where snow is created. God placed boundaries upon the water and showed us where rain comes from. God bounded the water. Water is life. We know this from the very first story that tells us about how important water is. Abraham and Sarah decided that Hagar should no longer be part of their family. She was getting too uppity as a slave. She needed to be put in her place, and she was cast out into the desert. And there in the desert, there in the desert as she cried and prayed and pleaded for her child to live, God created a stream of water to nourish her. And she is the first person who gives God a name. Water is life. As the Israelites were escaping from Egypt. As they were fleeing the oppressive, oppressive empire that enslaved them, they got to the edge of a body of water and thought this was their doom because behind them was an army set on their destruction. But water is life, and God parted those waters. God parted those waters and the Israelites were able to walk through. They were able to make it to the other side and discover life. But on the 
other side, it was a desert. And it was hard. And life was difficult, but because water is life, when they had complained one too many times, God said to Moses, tap your stick on the ground. And in that very spot, a spring burst out. Water is life. Water is life. Our first story of Jesus. The first story ever told of Jesus is being in a body of water. In that body of water, John baptized him and we hear, we hear those words that say, this is my beloved. This is my son. Listen to him. Water is life. Jesus went to a party with his mother. And his mother noticed that the party was not going the way it should because they ran out of wine. And so she said to her son, you need to do something about this. And he took those barrels of water he took barrels of water and changed it into wine. Wine that they had never experienced before. Wine that tasted better than anything they had previously had. Wine that came from water. Water is life. Jesus and the disciples have been traveling around the kingdom. <clears throat> speaking to everyone and healing them and teaching them about the love of God. And Jesus was tired and so decided to sit down. And the disciples went on ahead to get some food. But while he's sitting there, in the middle of the hot day, at a time when nobody is out carrying jugs of water, I mean, you know, carrying jugs of water, right? At that moment, a woman came up with her empty jugs to the place where Jesus sat to fill up her jugs of water. And she got into a discussion with Jesus. She got into a discussion with Jesus about life, about water, about our place within and to each other. She asked him how he could possibly speak to her, a woman who everyone else rejected. Remember, it's the middle of the day, very hot. Nobody else is around. All the other women, they went to get the water early in the morning, chatting, laughing, playing, singing. And she's on her own. And in that moment, as she's talking to Jesus, Jesus tells her that I can share with you the living water, the living water that can fill you up, that can heal you and make you whole. And she went and told everyone everything that he had done and said to her. She became one of his disciples, preaching the good news to the neighbors, preaching about the living water. Water is life. And yet every day, 660 children die because, because they do not have access to clean healthy, safe water. I don't know how many of you have seen the pictures lately, but the pictures that are coming out of Ethiopia and the desert region that has expanded and <clears throat> grown because of drought are horrifying. That this lake that used to 
used to nourish animals and people and plants is bone dry. And now you see pictures of the dead animals around it and pictures of the children starving because there's no food. Water is life. How many of you remember those words? Those words that are still being said over and over again by indigenous people in the United States who continue to fight for their right to have clean and safe water. Because you know what happens, right? When they go to decide where a pipeline is going to go, they don't take the straightest route. Because you know what? The straightest route is usually through the white neighborhoods. So they decide to build their pipelines through the territory where they will have the least impact. The people who won't fight back. And yet those elders, those indigenous women and men taught us that water is life. That that pipeline running underneath the Mississippi River, that pipeline running underneath the lake that starts the Mississippi River, that pipeline threaten their very existence, their ability to live. Because if it bursts, all their drinking water is gone. Water is life. We remember the people of Flint, Michigan, who to this day do not have clean water. Do you know how long ago that happened? President Obama pretended to take a drink of that water. That's how long ago it happened. To this day, they still do not have clean water. They have been fighting, fighting for clean water, to have pipes that do not kill their children. And what we learn from Flint is that there are so many neighborhoods so many communities that have unclean and unsafe water. But water is life. That's what Job tells us today as he sings about, as God sings about water, right? God sings about the things that we are crying about right now. God sings to Job do you know where the water is frozen? Where the storehouses of snow are kept? I want you to think about this. Did you know that Glacier National Park has 11 glaciers left? That in the next 10 years, we will have to change the name of the park because there will be no more glaciers. the storehouses of snow. How many of you have watched those chunks of ice, those chunks of <clears throat> ice, just fall into the ocean? And what does that look like? It looks like in Fiji, where one of the islands has now had its beaches eroded because the ocean has risen so high that the people who lived on that land can no longer make the living that they had because the trees that supported them, the farmland that they had, is destroyed because of the rising waters. Water is life. So what do we do about that, right? That's that's where I should get us to now. What do we do about that? Churches have taken different stances. There are two churches in North and South Carolina who've had to deal with the question of water. One of them is Crosstown. They call themselves a new kind of evangelical church that it welcomes everyone in. But what happened to Crosstown is in 2000,
2017, 2018, and 2019 in Charleston, hurricanes hit and wiped out their neighborhood and wiped out their church. And so they wanted to find out why. Why was this happening and how could we stop it? How could we make it safe for our church? But in the process of learning about what would make their church safe, they learned about what would make their neighbors safe. About the things that had to be done to make it so that their neighborhood was not a floodplain. About the information they gave, gained about how to rebuild after hurricanes. And they learned about how people don't have enough money to rebuild after a hurricane comes through. And so they made it their project to figure out how to help not only their church continue to be in this Charleston neighborhood, but to help their neighbors thrive. Water is life. Did you know that all of the canals in California, if we were to put solar panels on top of them, would have amazing benefits? Because they have done this in India. In India, where they put the solar panels over the top of the canals, it has a couple of impacts. It prevents the evaporation of water, and it cools down the solar panels so that they're more able to function and create more electricity. How many solar panels do we have over our canals here in California? How many solar panels could we have? <clears throat> so this week, I met a nice young man who we should ask that question of. Do you know him? His name is Lee. He's our congressperson, assemblyman for Fremont. And Lee is very, very interested in the environment. How about if all of us gave him the idea that we should put solar panels over our canals? If 30 of us contacted him about solar panels over the canals, would he do something? Because you know, all he's getting letters about right now, all he is getting letters about right now are what is happening in Washington, right? And so to get something that is his wheelhouse, trying to save the environment, might just make a difference. Water is life. Water is life. In our scripture today, Job invites us, invites us into that conversation where God, who asks us to understand, to make those connections between drought in Africa and solar panels in India and hurricanes in South Carolina. Job invites us to understand. I mean, one of the lines from the scripture today is, I have known you for forever. I have known you for forever. And I want you to understand. That's what God invites us to. To understand that water is life. I mean, because the last story we have of Jesus and water. Okay, it's not the last one, but it's the one I'm going to end on. <laughs> is the story of Jesus. Jesus is there in an upper room with his disciples. He's in an upper room with his disciples. And while he is there, he takes a basin of water. 
He kneels down in front of them and starts washing their feet. And when they say, no, 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 you cannot do this, Jesus tells them, he tells them the water is life. That servanthood is what we are called to. That we are called to look at the world, to see all those missing, broken, burnt parts, and do something. We're invited to remember that water is life. Amen.